Alrighty, so we're going. We're live. Helen, thank you for being here with us this morning. We really appreciate it. I didn't get to you first had Steve teachers walk in. I was walking around and I was asking anybody if they wanted to join and she graciously said yes. So as long as there's a soul to hear the word of God, Andrew and I will be here to deliver the message. We are more than well willing. So um, just so you know, Helen, what we've been doing uh, in our Bible study is we've been going through the book of Genesis and we've been going uh, chapter by chapter, um, person by person, just kind of looking at their lives and seeing the spiritual truths that their lives represent and, you know, what we can learn from them. Um, and we've made our way now up to Genesis chapter 24. So that's the chapter we're going to be talking about today. Um, it, to put you in context of what's going on, Abraham has uh, had a son named Isaac, uh, you know, in his, in his old age, at the age of like, you know, 99, 100, he had a child named Isaac in Genesis chapter 21. And in Genesis chapter 22, um, the Lord uh, kind of tested Abraham to give Isaac uh, up as a sacrifice to him. And that was a big picture for us of the father giving up the son for, for our behalf, right? And in Genesis chapter 23, we saw um, Sarah, Abraham's wife, pass away, which was a picture of Israel temporarily being set aside and divorced from God the Father uh, um, for a, a time being, but one day we know soon that God will come back for, for, for Israel and, to, and restore them unto himself. But now we're making a turn. And in the Bible, you'll notice that God doesn't do things um, one day and then do something different the next day. He always transitions. So we've been studying Abraham for quite some time now, well over a year, but now we're going to begin kind of um, as the Bible is transitioning into Isaac. And, the, and, and Genesis is going to start focusing more on Isaac. So chapter 24, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to dive in in a moment. I'm just going to start with a word of prayer, and we're going to see what God has for us today, okay? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for another day, Lord. We do thank you for Helen, Father God, for just uh, being willing to come and hear your word. Lord, I pray that you might just give her a special blessing this morning, Father God. Uh, open our ears, Lord, to hear from you this morning, Lord. Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law, Lord. Uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, just might just direct us and guide us into all truth today. Lord, uh, may you get all the honor and the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to start. We're going to read this whole first page together, uh, the first nine verses. Today, I'll be quite honest with you, it's a lot of reading because I want to show you the full story. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. So let's start with verse number one of chapter 24 in Genesis. Bible says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that sware unto me, saying, Unto thee, thy seed will I give this land. He, <coughs> excuse me. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if, there's a big if there, the woman will not be willing to follow thee, 
then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. So, that's where we're starting out right now. And uh, what we see going on, we see Abraham as a good dad. He thinks ahead. He says, I'm getting old. My, I mean, he said, right, that, that first verse said that he was well stricken in age. God, he had been blessed. And instead of thinking about himself, he's thinking about his son. He's thinking about his son. He says, I want my son to have a bride. I want my son to have a wife. So now he trusts. Notice who he trusts to do this for him. The eldest servant of his house. And there's a key phrase there in verse 2 that ruled over all that he had. So now, let's look at the big picture here of what this all represents. So we know that Isaac, we're on page 2 still, um, that Isaac represents and shows us a picture of Jesus Christ, the Son. And Abraham, as the father, pictures God the Father in this story. So now, the question is, who does the eldest servant represent? Now, notice he's not named. He's an unnamed servant. Yet, he's a servant that had authority. He's a servant that had rule over all that Abraham had. Hey, did you know, if you want to look at the next verse that we have for you, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, talking about Jesus Christ, that who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. You can, you can come if you'd like. Uh, and was made in the likeness of men. Uh, I don't know, someone just was looking. So we know this. When Jesus Christ became a man, he took upon him the form of a servant. The high king of heaven humbled himself down and became a servant to mankind. And uh, can I tell you this? He was the greatest servant of all time. He's our, he's our model of servitude. So now can I tell you this? The spirit that is in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of a servant. Not just a, a, any servant. We're talking about a servant who has rule. You know, the Bible says in 1 John, I don't have it written down for you, but in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, and the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one, it says. So the Trinity, right? You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is just as much of God as the Son and the Father. He is still God. So this eldest servant who remains unnamed to us is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. The unnamed servant who lives and breathes to serve his master, his father. So that's, that's the picture that we see here. So now we see the three characters. We see Abraham the father get, asking his servant, the Holy Spirit, to go get a bride for his son Isaac, Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. So now he doesn't ask the servant to go right around the corner. He's sending him all the way back to his land where Abraham came from, to his kindred. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Okay, so now let's read Genesis 24. Let's keep going in the story and see what else we got going on for us. Let's pick it up in verse number 10. The Bible says, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, this is the servant speaking right here. And he's praying. He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water. 
and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So a couple things that we can see here. Number one, we see that the servant took 10 camels. Well, he's looking for a bride for Isaac that is considered a Gentile, right? There's different groups of people mentioned in the Bible. There's the Jews, there's the Gentiles, and then there's the church of God. And you can look at that in 1 Corinthians. The Bible talks about those three groups of people. And the Spirit of Christ right now on the earth, like this servant, is looking for a Gentile bride for Jesus Christ. Looking for someone that's not, not, necessi not necessarily that Jews cannot be a part of the, uh, the bride of Christ, but primarily speaking, the bride is to be a Gentile. So the church today is primarily made of Gentiles. That's not to say that a Jew can't come to know Jesus Christ. My father is a Jew. My father came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. So it's very possible to, for, for a person to come onto the knowledge of Jesus Christ being a Jew or a Gentile. But primarily speaking, right now, God is dealing with Gentiles. And we see that he brought 10 camels because 10 in the Bible pictures the Gentiles. 10 is the number of the Gentiles in the Bible, if you didn't know. The second thing that we see he went all the way. We know where, where Abraham was dwelling in the land of, of Canaan, and he was by the city of Hebron. He went all the way from Hebron to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Can I tell you this? That journey, one way, is about 550 miles. That's a long journey. That's a journey taken by faith. He didn't, it's been almost 60 plus years over 60 years since Abram, now Abraham, had left his people. Who even knows if his, if his descendants, if his brethren, his kindred are even alive where, where the servant is going. So this servant went out by faith. This servant went a distance. You know what I can tell you this? Jesus Christ, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in... Um, in 2 Chronicles, let me, let me get there for you. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The Holy Spirit is looking out, going to and fro throughout the whole earth. It doesn't matter the distance. It's going to China, it's going to South America, it's going to America. The Holy Spirit goes everywhere and anywhere. Why? To find that bride. The distance doesn't matter for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's looking for anybody whose heart is ready to receive the Son. So now, notice where the Holy Spirit, or the servant in this case, uh, sets up shop. He sets up shop to look for this bride at the well of water. He's at the well of water. And he's, he's praying to God. He's like, God, he makes a specific prayer. If there be someone that comes uh, to this well and they come to draw some water, may they give me some drink. And without me even asking, can they give can they give water to my camels as well? And if this woman that does this, can you just point this woman out to me, God, so I can know that my journey was worth it, that I can know that this is the woman that you wanted me to bring back to my servant Isaac? You know, so that's the prayer that the servant is making. He's making it at the well of water. Can I tell you this? The Holy Spirit of God is looking for people who are coming to the well of water to draw water, that's where he's going to meet you. He's not going to meet you out and about. He's looking for people to come to the book, the Bible. Now, let me show you some verses that explain and show you that. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4. It says, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. 
and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. So the Bible likens wisdom to a wellspring, something that's, that's deep in the ground, that springs up water, that can give you life, that can give you refreshment, that can give you nourishment, that can keep you alive. Can I tell you this? In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, The Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So you can know that the words of God picture that well of water. That well of water is a picture for us of the words of God himself. That's where the Holy Spirit is looking to see if a woman is going to come that he can talk and bring back to his master Isaac, where the Holy Spirit can bring a person to Jesus Christ. It's not out and about in the world it's right here in the scriptures. That's where he's looking. So look at what happens, though. God is a very, God can answer prayer as quickly as you can think it. Look at this. Genesis chapter 25, verse 15. And it came to pass before he had done speaking. I mean, talk about answer to prayer. He prays the prayer and look at what comes right his way. That behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, unto, she said moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. I mean, can you picture it, Helen? Can you picture this? 550 miles of journeying. Who knows how many weeks. This guy, he gets to the, the first city of Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor. He's right outside the city. He comes to a well. He's like, you know what, God? I really need you to help me here. I really need you to answer this prayer. Make this journey worth it. Can you please show me who this damsel is going to be? And the first person to show up at the well is the kindred of Abraham. I mean, what an amazing thing. Can you imagine like the, the answer to prayer that quickly? No wonder why that guy hit the deck. He bowed down his head. He says, oh my Lord, you are amazing. You did it. You showed me the way. You answered my prayer. Hallelujah. And when God answers prayer, I can tell you, there's nothing sweeter. There's nothing sweeter than answered prayer. It's, it, it lets you know God's listening. God cares. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. There's nothing greater than to know that there is a God in heaven who is willing to not only listen, but to answer if it's according to his will. That's a blessing. That's what you said to me before, right? God willing. So now here's the thing. She went to the well. She drew from the well. And then she ran. When, when, when it came back to... to, to um, to, to, feed, to give water to the camels, it says that she ran and she did it again. She drew it again. Can I tell you this? 
It might not be the first time you hear the Bible. It might take some time to hear the words of God. But you keep drawing from that water. You'll have the faith to believe the servant that comes to you. You'll have faith to believe what the Holy Spirit has for you and what he's desiring in your life. The Bible says right there in Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just like that, just like Rebecca came and, and drew water from that well. Hey, you can draw water from the scriptures, from the word of God itself, and you can get some faith to believe what the servant wants to do. Can I tell you this? We're gonna, I skipped some verses because I, didn't want to, I couldn't fit the whole chapter on all the pages for us, but the servant, I just want to give you a, a synopsis of what happens next. The servant comes to go with his camels and the people that were with him come to be with Rebecca and they go to her house. And her brother Laban her father Bethuel and her mother are all there and you know they, they give the um, the camels some food that's what provender is they ungird them they they get them in they they wash the servant's feet and they try to set some food before the servant can I tell you this the servant I don't have it written down for you but I want to read this verse to you because it's important in verse 33 of the chapter the servant says I will not eat until I have told mine errand and they said, speak on. So I don't have that written down for you, but I want to point it out that the, the servant, the Holy Spirit, is on strict business to tell you his errand. He's trying to tell you about his master and his master's son. Can I tell you this? Look at John chapter 15, verse 26 right there, talking about the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, when the Comforter, that's the name for the Holy Spirit, is come whom I will send unto you from the Father, just like the servant was sent from Abraham, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, talking about Jesus Christ. So the servant doesn't talk about himself. The servant is only interested in telling the bride, telling this woman about Isaac about all that Abraham had gone through, about all that Abraham now had and owned, the riches, because the Bible talks in this chapter as well, how the God had blessed Abraham, how he gave him maid servants, men servants, animals, land, gold, silver, all these things. And then it says this, what an amazing verse. It says this in 36 about Abraham. It says at the end of that verse, unto him, meaning Isaac, hath he given all that he hath. You know the Son, Jesus Christ, everything that the Father has, he's given to the Son. So now, right, so he's telling them this. He goes and he explains his journey to the family. He lets them know all the stuff that we just read about. He says, I went from Abraham, I came here, I stood by the well, I prayed to God it, in, in my heart, even when I was done speaking in my heart, your daughter came, she, she, she answered, uh, she fulfilled the prayer that I, and the request that I had, and he goes to ask the father and the brother, he says, can I have, can Rebecca come with me to be the bride of Isaac? And they said, Phew. It seems like this is of God. Who are we to say no? Take her and go. So now they, they, they get married. They, there's rejoicing. There's, there's, uh, there's like, um, they tarry all night. And in the morning, the servant says, it's time to go. Let's go. So look at, let's pick it up now in Genesis 24, verse 55. So look at what it says here. And her brother and her mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. 
And they sent away Rebekah their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. Can I tell you this? There's a lot of things in this world that will try to keep you from going to be with Jesus Christ. The Bible, it could be family. It could be friends. It could be social status. All these things that thoughts that come up in your mind even possibly now where the devil is trying to say, ignore that. Keep that away. You know what the Holy Spirit says? Hinder me not. I got to get my bride, I got to get this bride back to be with Isaac. I got to get this woman to go be with her husband to be. That's what the Holy Spirit wants. He's desiring for you to go. But notice in the beginning of the chapter when Isaac, well, I'm sorry, when the servant was talking with Abraham, they had that discourse where the servant said, "What if she's not willing to go?" And Abraham said, if she's not willing to go, don't worry about it. That's her business. That's be- you're, you're clear from the oath, my servant. So can I tell you this? The decision of whether or not a person is to come to Jesus Christ is nobody else's to make but their own. Nobody can ever force someone to trust on Jesus Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can convince you and show you what all God has for you and what He wants for you, but you ultimately have to make that decision. Look at what it says there, what we read. She, they asked her in verse 58, Wilt thou go with this man? And you know what her response was? I will. You see what that means? That you have a will. You have a choice. You can either choose Christ or you can reject Christ. There is no middle ground. He, she was either going to go with them or stay. And that's the decision you and I have to make. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's a big if right there. Your salvation... Your eternity, where you spend the rest of eternity in heaven or in hell, hangs on that if. Are you willing to receive what Christ has done for you on the cross already? What he did on the cross was for your sins and my sins. He died in our place. He died so that we wouldn't have to die. He bore our sins so we wouldn't have to bear our sins. The Bible says, yes, there is one God. We talked about that before, right, Helen? There is one God, but it also says there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You can't get to God unless you're going through Jesus Christ. And that verse right there that we just read in Romans 10, 9 makes it so simple. You say, what do I have to do to be saved? Call upon the Lord for salvation. Just believe in your heart that what he did on the cross was enough. The father said it was enough. In Isaiah 53, the Bible says that that sacrifice to the father was sufficient. It satisfied him. So, hey, if it satisfies the father what Christ did on the cross, what else more do you have to worry about? All you have to do is put your trust in him. You say, how can it be that simple, Josh? Can it really be as simple as calling out for him? The Bible says, look at what it says here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul is writing, he says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, just like Rebecca, to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Hey, if it had to be any other way, if there was any other way to heaven, why did Jesus die? If it could be any other way, why did God have to send his son to die in our place. There is no other way, the Bible says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So that's a decision and a choice that every person has to make while they're here on earth. While you still have breath in your body, God is asking you, will you come? Will you be my bride? Will you come to be with me? Look at what I did for you. All I'm asking is, will you come to be with me? And your answer determines where you spend eternity. Luckily, not luckily, but God bless Rebecca, she made the right choice. She chose to go with the servant. Can you imagine that? She's never met this man, Isaac. Hey, I've never met Jesus Christ. She's only ever heard about him, just like you've only ever heard about Jesus Christ. But she decided to follow this servant, just like you and I may have decided to trust what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell us about Jesus Christ to go to be with him. Look at what it says now in Genesis 24. Let's finish up this chapter. Verse 61, Bible says, And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well Lahairoi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother, his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. What a happy ending, amen? What a beautiful ending. You know what? The world, they try to copy what the Bible does. They try to give you happy endings. There ain't no happy ending like God's happy ending. God gives a beautiful ending to the story. If you trusted in Jesus Christ, can I tell you, your fate is sealed. Your destination is sure. God wants you to know one day you will be with Christ. Hey, Right now, that, uh, we're, we're, like that, we're like Rebecca right now. We're just following the man. We're just following that Holy Spirit, his leading. Not, we're, we're, we haven't met with Isaac yet. We haven't saw Jesus Christ face to face yet. But one day we will. On this journey we call life, we're just trying to trust the Holy Spirit. Notice this, that when she sees him, her eyes are going up. Right? What it says in verse um, 64, it says Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. It's almost like she went up. She lighted off the camel. She got up and, oh, and, and off of it. Can I tell you? And she was looking up. Can I tell you this? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just like Isaac went to the field, which is a picture of the world, to go meet Rebekah, so too do the, does the Christian have this hope that one day soon, Jesus Christ is going to split that sky, and one day we're going to lift up our eyes and see our beloved, and just like Rebekah met Isaac in the field, we're going to meet the Lord in the air to be with him forever. So shall we ever be with the Lord, it says right there. Ever be. Never to be separated. Just like Isaac and Rebekah became one, they became married, so too will God's church finally be with her bridegroom. Can I tell you this? It says right there at the end that he loved her. Isaac loved Rebekah. Past 
tense. Past tense. That's important. Now, this is the second time the word love shows up in your Bible. The first time is in Genesis 22, referring to Abraham loving Isaac, which is a picture of the father and, and the son, the love that they have one to another. That comes first. That's the most important love. But can I tell you, the, the, next, the next time love shows up in your Bible, it's Christ. The picture is Christ loving the church. Look at what it says there, our last verse. In Ephesians 5.25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives. That's good advice. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You say, how do I know that God loves me? That's a good question. How do you know? The cross is the answer. That was God's display of love to mankind. The Bible says... In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I tell you this, Jesus Christ loves you now, but He loved you so much that He died on that cross for you in your place 2,000 years ago. Why? so that you might receive the gift of eternal life now, so you can be with Him forever. And that's what we learn from Genesis chapter 24. The beautiful picture of the servant, the Holy Spirit, finding a bride, the church, for Isaac, Jesus Christ. I hope you're in that bride. I hope you've made that choice, and you've made that decision to call upon Jesus Christ for salvation, because it only takes a moment Let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this time and this space, Father God. Thank you for the kind attention of Helen, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you just might have been made clear, Lord, all the things that you'd have for us to learn today. Uh, I pray that you might just uh, bless this place, Father God. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, I pray that it might just bear much fruit unto your name. In Jesus' name, amen.